I want to invite you to turn to Genesis. The theme intertwined all through the book of Genesis. Hopefully you have seen this theme. And the theme is that God is sovereign. God is Sovereign. We see it all through the book of Genesis, but as you continue to read the Bible, you will see this theme all the way to the end, the last verse found in Revelation as well. God is sovereign. What does it mean? It means he is control over all things. He is in control over all things. He is creator of all things. He is ahead of all things and behind all things. That's who our God is. And that's why we can declare a song like that. But all my life, you have been faithful. So this theme has been intertwined through the entire book of, of Genesis. John Frame explains that the sovereignty of God is the same as the lordship of God. God is sovereign over all creation. Over all creation. And we're going to see that, I believe, come alive in this closing text, this closing message in Genesis chapter 50. Over this past year, there have been eight different teaching series. And the reason for eight is because the book of Genesis can be broken up into eight different sections. The first four sections are the first four major events. And it spans from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11, and it spans 2,000 years. The latter four sections are the first four major people, are the first four major characters, and it spans from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 50, and it's a span of some 300 years. The first four sections, the first four major events, we start with creation. It's the beginning of all things. Then we quickly find the fall of man. Man sins against a holy God. What God had designed in the Garden of Eden for us to enjoy and walk with him, this paradise, this place of perfection, sin enters and destroys it all. And since that point, the mission have of God has been to save, rescue, redeem humanity from their sins. And so the second section is the fall of man. Then the third section is the flood. The flood. God is going to set things straight and, and cause this flood. And only those that board this, this ark as God had commanded Noah. Because Noah was the only one at the time that, that, that was found to be righteous. And he walked with God. And so God preserved Noah. God preserved Noah and his family. And the animals that boarded the ark. That's the third section. And then God gives this promise at the end of the, the flood. This, this beautiful rainbow. And so even till today, we step out and we see the rainbow, a beautiful promise from God. He will never flood the earth again. The fourth section, or the fourth major event is the tower. Mankind comes, they, they, they come to Shina, the valley of Shina, and they have this great uh, uh, decision to Build something for the rest of the world to see. We'll build it for ourselves. We want to make a name for ourselves. And, and isn't that what you and I tend to, to fall victim of? We want to build a name. God says, no, 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 you're not going to build a name for yourself. There's only one name that's worthy to be praised, and it's my name. So God scatters the people. We see in chapter 12, it's the first character introduced, the first major person, and his name is Abraham. His name is Abraham, and God calls him from the land of Ur to a land to which he doesn't know. And how does he find that land? But he has to stay faithful to God, listen to the voice of God, and walk in faith. And Abraham certainly lived a life of, of faith. And from Abraham, the second major he has a son, and, and it's Isaac. And Abraham received this inheritance, this blessing from God that the land was going to be given. And then there was this covenantal uh, promise that the Lord would be with him and for him. 
And this is passed down to Isaac. And Isaac has a dysfunctional family. Do you, do you recall? It's a bit of a dysfunctional family. And so that's good news for most of us. <laughs> God is still good and he's still faithful in the midst of the dysfunction. And he uses dis, dysfunctional people for his glory. Somehow we take a step back and we say praise be to God. That if he can save someone like me, he can save anyone. If he can use someone like me, he can use anyone. Praise be to God. The third, the third major person is Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the blessing is passed down from one to the next. And, and we've seen Jacob in, in his life. What a mess of a life. Jacob and his brother Esau battling since the womb. Growing up, battling one another. And somehow, only because of the mercy of God, the blessing followed Jacob. The fourth major character is the current series, the text that we've been studying. His name is Joseph. Joseph. Genesis begins with life. And ends with death. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 50 verse 26. You can read for yourself. Joseph died at the age of 110. They embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. Genesis begins with life, and it ends with death. Look back to chapter 49. You see from verse 29 to 33 of chapter 49, Jacob is on his deathbed. He's already uh, prophesied over his sons. He's gathered them around his bed. And the final instruction that we see at the close of chapter 49 is his burial instructions. He doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wants to go back to the land of Canaan. And he wants to be buried next to Abraham, Isaac. So he gives these instructions. Then if you read the beginning of chapter 50, what you will find is his burial. There's this great procession that, that leaves Egypt and heads to the land of Mamre. The land of Canaan. Verse 12 of chapter 50 says, So Jacob's sons did for him what he had commanded them. So Jacob gives these final instructions. His sons follow through in obedience. They bury their father, Jacob, and then they return back to Egypt. They all return back to Egypt. Verse 14 says, after Joseph buried his father, he returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone with him to bury his father. Verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we caused him. Now, in case you're just joining in this biblical narrative and you're wondering what's all the suffering that they caused their brother Joseph, it was the brothers that saw Joseph, young Joseph, 17 years of age, coming from a distance to check on the brothers as they had moved on to Dothan, this area where they were watching their sheep and their sheep were grazing and they began plotting against their brother Joseph. Joseph arrives and what takes place next? They strip him of this robe that, that Jacob had gifted him. And they throw him in a pit. It's perhaps that suffering that they're reminded of after Jacob's death. They throw him in this pit. And then they see these Ishmaelite traders on this caravan route coming towards them. And they said, no, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell them. 
And so they sell, they sell Joseph to the Ishmaelite traders and the Ishmaelite traders make their way to Egypt. And what happens next? Joseph is sold into Potiphar's house. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. Joseph, though, is a man of character. He's a man that does not compromise. He's a man that we don't read any account that he has ever complained. Joseph works hard and gains the trust of Potiphar. And he is entrusted to oversee Potiphar's house. Perhaps it's this suffering. Or it's the suffering of a living in a pagan land, wondering, will you ever see your family again? Will you ever see your father again? Perhaps it's this suffering. And then we continue to read the account of Joseph as we have over the past several weeks. And and we find that Potiphar's wife wants, she wants Joseph for herself. You know what I mean? She wants him. And, And so she pursues him and doesn't let up on him. And by the way, that's a message in itself. If if somebody's pursuing you and wants you, you better run the other way, remove yourself as quick as you 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 can. Joseph tries to do so, and what happens? There's a false accusation. And so Potiphar throws Joseph in prison. And so he's sitting in prison, one of the darkest, loneliest places. And can you imagine the suffering as he's sitting in prison? What have I done? Could you just imagine? I mean, you, you, can, you can probably imagine because the questions that you would ask. <laughs> but I just did the right thing. I obeyed my father. I went to check on my brothers. My brothers threw me in the pit, sold me into slavery. I made this journey down to, down to Egypt and I worked hard. I served Potiphar well. And this is what I get, prison. So from prison, he interprets these dreams. And he gains the trust of Pharaoh and he becomes number two over all Egypt. And even in this new position of power, not once do we see that he tries to run back to Canaan, but he stays and remains planted where God had called him. This suffering. When Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, if Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we caused him. Can you just imagine before we forward uh, the thoughts and the concerns that are overwhelming the minds and hearts of the brothers here in this moment can you just imagine with me they know what they have done but here's the beauty of it all as we're going to see joseph had already forgiven them and so who's living in a prison in this moment it's not joseph it's the brothers verse 16 so they sent this message to joseph Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's transgression and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. And, And so they formed this plan. Now, I can't prove it, but I can only assume that Jacob did not tell them, instruct them to give this message to Joseph. They have yet again tried to play the deceit route. They form this plan, and this message is communicated to Joseph. We find these words, Joseph wept. The last part of verse 17, do you see that in your Bibles? Joseph wept. This is the seventh time from chapter 42 to 50 that we read specifically that Joseph wept. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how weeping reveals the, the heart. Weeping reveals your character. There's this myth that only the weak weep, but there is actually strength, and God has designed our bodies for a mourning process, and Joseph weeps. Verse 18, his brothers also came to him, bowed down before him and said, we are your slaves. 
Joseph receives this message. He weeps. The brothers come in. They bow down before him. They bow down before him. Now, Joseph at this point is 47 years old. Fact check me. Do your own study to make sure that what I'm sharing is is right, accurate, and truth. This moment, Joseph's 47 when his father died. And this is the last recording of his brothers bowing down before him. Now, in... If you recall, Joseph has this this dream at 17 years of age. And the dream is that his brothers will bow down before him, the first dream. The second dream is that his brothers and his father and mother will bow down before him. And what we have seen is that time and time again, the brothers have bowed down before him. Even his father, as he sees him bows down before him. This dream is finally fulfilled here in chapter 50, verse 18. Verse 19 says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. What comforting words. I mean, they, they don't know what to think. They're, they're fearful. They, 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 they're assuming that Joseph has been holding out that this bitterness or anger has built up over 30 years and that perhaps now is the time, now is the moment. Without Jacob, with Jacob out of the picture, now he will strike vengeance. But we we don't see that. We don't see that. And I'm telling you today, if there's any bitterness within you, If there's anything that is unsettled, that is living within you, today would be the best day to surrender it over to the Lord Jesus. Don't take it into 2024 with you. Don't hold on to the grudge. Don't hold on to the bitterness. Don't hold on to the hurt. Don't hold on to the anger. Don't allow the enemy to gain another foothold of your life, Ephesians chapter 4 declares. Surrender it over to him. Joseph had certainly done this. Because he says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Who do you think I am? He says to his brothers. They're bowing down before him. And they're concerned for their lives. And he said, hey, hey, don't be afraid. Who do you think I am? Am I God? Am I, do I sit on his throne? Look at verse, verse 20. You planned evil against me. God planned it for good. Do you see this? How do we know that? How do we know that Joseph had surrendered the hurt, surrendered the suffering, had forgiven, truly forgiven his his brothers? We see it in his response in verse 20. You planned evil against me, but God planned it for good. I believe one of the most profound scriptures in all the scriptures. You planned evil against me. God planned it for good. This moment, Joseph will look back. And he will see that the Lord was with him. And it was the Lord that extended kindness to him. Genesis chapter 39 verse 21. As he sits in the prison cell. He is reminded that the Lord was with him. And the Lord had extended kindness to him. There wasn't a suffering that he would face. Alone. Apart from the Lord his God. Apart from the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. And church hear me clearly today. There is not a trial. Tribulation. Suffering. There is not a moment in time. That you will face. Apart from the Lord our God. Who is with you. And who is good. And who is faithful. Why? Because he is sovereign over all things. He is absolutely without a doubt. In control of all things. 
I pray that you will take great comfort in that truth. A.W. Tozer said this, when I understand that everything happening to me is to make me more Christ-like, it resolves a great deal of anxiety. Hear me again, hear me again. When I understand that everything happening to me is to make me more Christ-like, it resolves a great deal of anxiety. How could Joseph stand before his brothers who had, yes, caused such great suffering upon him? How could he stand with confidence? Tell them, don't be afraid. But you planned for evil. God used it for good. James chapter 1, verse 2. Would you write this reference down? Scripture says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. How can we experience trials and tribulations and suffering and harm and all these things? How can we do it with joy? It's because we believe this truth. That God is sovereign over every detail of our life and that God is for us and that God is with us and that it is the Lord our God empowering us. God is sovereign over all things. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We, we know that we know that we know that all things, good things, bad things, it's all the things in the middle they work together for our good God has a purpose for your life hear me today there there is always a purpose for any pain that you might endure any pain that you experienced this past year any pain that you experience in this new year there's always a purpose it's to to grow you it's to develop you it's to shape you It's to see things through his perspective. It's to trust him. It's to draw you closer to him. Verse 20. Joseph says, to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. He says, I've endured all this. What you planned for evil, God meant for for good. Why? Because without this, without me landing in Egypt... great famine would have swept and wiped out the people. God in his sovereignty was bringing protection for the line of the king of kings who would come from this family. What we have just celebrated would not be possible had Joseph not have landed in Egypt, had Joseph not have been faithful to his God Could you just imagine how the story would would go if Joseph fought at every turn, if Joseph turned angry, if Joseph didn't serve well, if Joseph refused to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, if Joseph even ran back to Canaan. Could you just imagine? But, but, But the story doesn't end like that. We don't see the story like that. Why? Because Joseph's practical theology was this. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Look at verse 21. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Did you see this? This is how we know. This is how we know. He said, don't be afraid. I I will take care of you and your children. And he says this. Scripture says he comforted them and spoke kindly kindly to them. Joseph will continue to show kindness to his brothers for the remaining 54 years of his life. He dies at age 110. What we see through the life of Joseph is that Joseph looks a lot like Jesus. How many times have you shifted your priorities or shifted your respect? You put someone in the place of of Jesus. It's it's easy in this world to, to do so, to fall into the trap 
I believe that's why a daily surrender, a daily walk with the Lord is so important and key to keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus. Joseph looks a lot like Jesus. Hear me out. Chapter 37, verse 3. Joseph was uniquely loved by his father. So uniquely loved by his father that Jacob had one coat made for Joseph. The rest of the sons didn't get it. Only Joseph. Joseph was uniquely loved by his father. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17. God says, this is my son, talking about Jesus, whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Genesis chapter 37 verse 4, Joseph was hated by his brothers. He was hated by his brothers. Fast forward to the New Testament, religious leaders were jealous and hated Jesus. False witnesses were brought in with accusations. They demanded Jesus's blood. I tell you, Jesus is a better Joseph. Genesis 37 verse 28, Joseph's brothers sold him to the Ishmaelite traders for 20 shekels. Fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is a better Joseph. Chapter 39 of Genesis, we find uh, that Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph of rape. Jesus was falsely accused for crimes he did not commit. Jesus is a better Joseph. Chapter 40, Genesis, Jesus suffered along two criminals. He suffered along two criminals, the baker and the butler. The baker died, the butler went free. Our Jesus suffered between two criminals. One blasphemed him, one mocked him, one ridiculed him, while the other one confessed. Church Jesus is a better Joseph. Chapter 42, verse 6, Joseph was in charge of, of everything. As has already been stated, he became the second in command over all Egypt. If anyone wanted food or rain, they had to stand before Joseph. And what does Jesus declare in John chapter 6, verse 35? I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty. Again, I tell you today, Jesus is a better Joseph. Chapter 37, as I already shared, Joseph has this dream that his brothers will bow before him. His brothers and father and mother will bow before him. And we see in chapter 42, this is taking place. We see in chapter 47. We see it in chapter 48. We see all of this. Everyone had to bow in Joseph's presence. But Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There is coming a day. That everyone will bow before him. I tell you today, Jesus is a better Joseph. Joseph showed kindness before his death to his family and future descendants. Jesus, hear me, Jesus showed kindness through his death to all humanity. John 14, 6 Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I tell you, Jesus is a better Joseph. Do you see the kindness? As we close, verse 21, he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Did you hear this testimony? Did you hear the testimony? What stood out knowing this message and how we would close this message, I just stood back with so much joy 
and gratitude. That's the kindness of those around this young lady that drew her in. Church, if we are not marked by our kindness, I don't know what to tell. I don't know what to say. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? It's the very kindness of God that he has shown us that leads us to the point where we repent and where we turn from our sinful ways and say, here's my life, take it, use me. Joseph looks a whole lot like Jesus. However, Jesus is a better Joseph. And the question today is, do you? The question I'm considering, do I? Do I? Can people tell that, that we are children of God by our kindness? And so how will you show kindness? 2024, how will you show kindness? How will you extend kindness? For the remaining 54 years of his life, he... Joseph extended kindness to, to his brothers. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 tells us that kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. There's evidence of your life that you are walking with the Lord, that, that you are a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's by your kindness. There's fruit. The world will see kindness in, in you. Ephesians 4.22 says, be kind and compassionate. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as you have been forgiven kindness kindness would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place those joining us online would you just take a moment and would you just say this this simple ask this simple question Lord what is my response from all of this from, from what I've witnessed today from the music to the testimonies to the message, what, what is my response? Perhaps you've been wavering and, and may, maybe the reason you're here today is because the final day of the year, you want to surrender it over to the Lord stepping into a new year tomorrow. And so I just wonder, what is your response? Would you just get alone with the Lord and, and just ask that simple question, what is my response? As people are praying all across this place, maybe you, you know what your response is and, and you would just go ahead and begin praying that right now. Maybe you're holding, you're withholding some areas of your life rather than surrendering it all over to him. And today would be the day that you surrender it all over to him. You trust him. And that would be your prayer right where you're sitting. I surrender. Well, thank you for your faithfulness and goodness this past year. Moving into a new year, I surrender. Help me to restart. Help me to focus my eyes on you. Help me to live for you. Help me to extend kindness so that a lost world will know the God whom I serve. As people are praying all across this place, perhaps there's one that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. And I, I would tell you today, that's the starting point of all of this. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but salvation is really transformation. It's surrender of oneself over to the only one who can provide complete forgiveness of sins. And so today, if that's your decision, your decision, the final day of 2023, I want to just ask if that's you, as people are praying all across this place and you're praying online with us, would you just have the courage just to look up at me if, if that's your decision to surrender over to the Lord Jesus for salvation today, to ask him to forgive you of all your sins, to trust him. If that's your decision, would you just have the courage just to look up at me? No one else, just people are praying and that's your decision. I want to surrender over to the Lord Jesus for salvation today. There's salvation in the Lord. Do you mean that, my sister? Anyone else, that would be your decision. If some over here, your decision, surrender over to the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. Anybody else? People are praying. Anybody else? 
If you're online, would you let us know? That's your decision. I'm going to pray with those that are looking up at me, saying, I want to surrender over to the Lord Jesus. And as I lead them in this prayer, I want to challenge you. Those that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ today, would you commit to follow him all the days of your life? Would you do that now? Those that are looking up at me, would you say something like this from, from your heart to God's? Would you call on his name, say, dear Jesus, something like, dear Jesus, acknowledge who he is. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I've, missed, I've messed up. I've made mistakes. I'm born into sin. But you, Jesus, are the Savior. You're the Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. I trust in you completely today. I believe in you. Would you tell them that? You walked this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave. And you rose victorious on the third day for me. Would you tell them that? I believe. Thank you for saving me. I want to live for you. Help me to live for your glory. Would you, would you thank him? All across this place, those that made a decision. Can we celebrate that? Those that made a decision, can we just celebrate that today in the house?